right from the beginning of working on the letter, Paul said to me, you have to tell me exactly what you think about what I'm doing. Nothing else will help me. Nothing else will work. Well, at first, you know, I didn't take that seriously for a moment. Nobody wants to hear the truth. He really does. So I tell him. And he changes things the same way that I change things. This is a true collaboration between two people who really trust each other's taste. What a librettist is, first of all, is a guy who creates the enabling condition for an opera. Uh, an opera libretto is not a work of art. It's the pretext by which the composer creates the work of art. And if that's true, and the opera, the composer and the librettist have a fundamental disagreement, then the only smart thing for the librettist to do at that point is to do what the composer wants. And so I said to myself, if we ever have that kind of dispute, I'll do what Paul wants. But it never happened. When I got the idea for the libretto, which is, is my idea, um, I immediately thought of it as what we call a vaudeville. Uh, and that word, by the way, has actually been taken over into the Russian, vaudeville. Uh, it's a cognate. Um, I thought of it as something more like a musical comedy than as an opera, that it would be, unlike the letter, it would be a number opera. Uh, the numbers would be separate. Uh, there would be easel cards off to the side of the stage that identified each scene. Um, and, and this is where the, the, the popular music element comes in. That since it is a vaudeville, that many of the numbers would be cast in dance forms of the period. I mean, one of the numbers is a soft shoe, for example. Uh, there's a waltz. Uh, there are, are all sorts of numbers that are quite clearly rooted in what you might have heard on an American vaudeville stage in the teens and twenties. And we give the singers opportunities for movement that will be comfortable to them. Because you don't want any opera to be physically static, but you really don't want an opera that's about a, a ballet composer, a ballet impresario, a conductor, uh, and a very famous dancer to be physically static. It has to have movement built into it. This, by the way, is the reason why we chose to use Pierre Monteux as the fourth character, instead of Nicholas Rorick, who was the artist who created the design, the decor, for the original production of The Rite of Spring. It would have been just as logical for Rorick to be the fourth character, and I considered that as a possibility. But then I thought, well, let's have a conductor, because a conductor gets up on the podium, and he has a baton, and he waves his arms. Now, there's a natural, physical aspect to his presence on stage. You have four, in real life, you have four sharply differentiated appearances in the four characters. Stravinsky is this little Russian gnome, and Diaghilev is this great big physical dandy. Uh, uh, Nijinsky is a ballet dancer, but a rather compact fellow. And Montu had this interesting hair, which was you know both white and black at the same time. Uh, and as I imagined the four characters, I thought, okay, these guys, this is going to work, and they'll all have reasons to be physical. It will all fit together very well. Um, so when I sat down to write the libretto, uh, I wove into the libretto things that Stravinsky had actually said, things that Diaghilev and Nijinsky had actually said. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a work of fiction. It's meant to be funny. Uh, it's not a piece of, of potted history. But it tracks what happened what really happened in an accurate way, and uh, although it's very compressed and it's a vaudeville and so it's supposed to be funny, uh, it bears a clear relationship to the truth of the creation of the Rite of Spring, um, without, I hope, ever compromising the fact that it is supposed to be a, a, a comedy. Mm -hmm. We wanted it to be funny. We want people to laugh as they watch this. Mm -hmm. And the music is funny. I mean, I knew that Paul had an untapped... Paul's a very funny man. He's really funny. He's much funnier than I am. And I knew that he had an untapped potential for writing comic music. And that was why, uh, when we were approached about doing Dos Rus, that I got the idea that it should actually be a comic opera. A part of what makes a comic number funny is the fact that it does rhyme, and the rhymes are placed in certain kinds of ways. Uh, it, it's what gives a number its kick, its effect. And the more complicated the rhyme, the funnier it is, as long as the singer can actually execute it and make it come on clearly. Um, in all cases, the text came first. Um, 
And that's, that's an area, by the way, where Paul and I are very clear about how this has to work. Um, people always ask which comes first, the words or the music. Um, in popular songwriting, you never can tell. Uh, with Rodgers and Hart, uh, 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 the music came first. With Rodgers and Hammerstein, the lyrics came first, usually. But with us, almost without exception, uh, the words come first. They give Paul the framework, the rhythmic framework, and the dramatic framework on which to hang the music. The point of a workshop is to find out what works. And there's only one way to do that, and that's to get the performers on their feet and hear it. Theater, I always say, is the empirical art form. It is about what works, and there's no test of what works until you get the show in front of an audience. In a play, the timing of lines is set by the performers and by the director. In an opera, it's set by the composer. The timing is written into the music. And so we've got to hear that music done so we can figure out not just mechanical things like how long is it going to take Stravinsky to get across the stage, but how many beats do we need in order for the punchline to register. And that's entirely up to, the, to what we hear in the workshop. I'll, I'll, I'll say this, I love it. And when Paul and I took our curtain call for the letter last year, we both felt the same thing, which was, let's do this again. But you know, you don't do it for fun. Somebody's got to write the check. Uh, we're both professionals. We do this for a living. So we're not going to just sit down and write an opera, you know, like Mickey and Judy, to have fun. But it is fun. And the response to the letter was quite extraordinary. And I hope that the response to Dallas Bruce will be favorable. And I hope that it will cause people to say, oh, let's ask them to write an opera, because we have a lot of possible ideas for operas that we'd like to do. Um, extremely varied ideas, I mean, I, all over the map. Uh, I wasn't expecting that our second opera would be a comic opera, but I'm thrilled that it is. Uh, our first opera was like the operatic component of film noir. Um, if we get a chance to do a third one, I hope it will be as different from Das Russe is Das Russe is different from the letter. But I love this. I love collaborating, which is not something that I've done a lot of since college. I love collaborating with somebody of essentially compatible mind. Paul and I are very different kinds of people, but when it comes to art, we're on the same page. And we work well, we work pleasurably together. And uh, yes, of course, I would dearly love to do this again. But it's not up to me. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you. Sure.